designed CO2 fixation in E. coli. There was a recent article in Science Daily entitled Laboratory Evolved Bacteria Switched to Consuming Carbon Dioxide for Growth. The title almost sounds like they did it themselves without any help. And the first two paragraphs are even more interesting. Uh, this is actually quite recent, November 27 of this year. The source is Cell Press, which is um, promoting an article in the journal Cell, which is a pretty good journal, actually. The summary, which passes for their little abstract, I guess, is over the course of several months, researchers created Escherichia coli strains that consume carbon dioxide for energy instead of organic compounds. Wait a minute, how do you get energy out of carbon dioxide anyway? That'd be a nice trick if you could do it, but um, uh, biochemically that's hard to figure out. This uh, achievement in synthetic biology highlights the incredible plasticity of bacterial metabolism and could provide the framework for future carbon neutral bioproduction. So we're going to tackle global warming with this little thing. Um, the first paragraph is over the course of several months, researchers in Israel created Escherichia coli, that's an old familiar E. coli, strains that consume carbon dioxide for energy instead of organic compounds. Well, that wasn't a misprint. They actually put it in twice. This achievement in synthetic biology highlights the incredible plasticity of bacterial metabolism and could provide the framework for future carbon neutral bioproduction. The work appears in November 27th in the journal Cell. So this is a press release from the day the paper came out so that you'll read it. By the way, the paper is on the internet too, so we'll be able to look at that. Our main aim was to create a convenient scientific platform that could enhance CO2 fixation. Wait a minute, fixation isn't the same thing as getting your energy source, is it? Um, which can help address challenges related to sustainable production of foods and fuels and global warming caused by CO2 emissions. Okay, so we can grow plants that will take in carbon dioxide and that'll decrease the carbon dioxide in the air. So since uh, senior author Ron Milo at system, a systems, that is at systems biology, I just copied and pasted, biology, that should be A systems I'm sure, at the Weizmann Institute of Science, converting the carbon source of E. coli, the workhorse of biotechnology, from organic compound uh, carbon into CO2 is a major step toward establishing such a platform. Okay, so it grows on CO2, it doesn't use CO2 for an energy source. Got it. The living world is divided into autotrophs that convert organic, inorganic CO2 into biomass and heterotrophs that consume organic compounds. Like us, we have to eat things like sugar. Uh, Autotrophic organisms dominate the biomass on Earth. Autotrophic, they, what kind of organisms are those? Well, they're plants, right? Okay. And supply much of our food and fuels. Auto supply all of it, but that's a different issue. A better understanding of the principles of autotrophic growth and methods to enhance it, it is critical for the path to sustainability. So we have to figure out how this works. <clears throat> a grand challenge in synthetic biology <coughs> has been to generate synthetic autotrophy within a model heterotrophic organism, convert a heterotroph into an autotroph. Despite widespread interest in the renewable energy storage and more sustainable food production, past efforts to engineer industrial relevant heterotrophic model organisms to use CO2 as a sole carbon source have failed. It happens all the time, but we can't do it. Previous attempts to establish autocatalytic CO2 fixation cycles in model heterotrophs always required the addition of multi-carbon organic compounds to achieve stable growth. They tried, but you have to keep giving them sugar, and of course, uh, sugar takes uh, a lot to make. 
From a basic scientific perspective, we wanted to see if such a major transformation in the diet of bacteria, from dependence on sugar to the synthesis of all their biomass from CO2, is possible, says first author Shmuel, uh, that's Samuel in, in Hebrew, Gleiser, um, a Weizmann Institute of Science postdoctoral fellow. Beyond testing the feasibility of such a transformation in the lab, we wanted to know how extreme an adaptation is needed in terms of the changes to the bacterial DNA blueprint. So they're going to try to make E. coli into something that actually eats CO2 or brings CO2 in for making its biomass. In the cell study, the researchers used metabolic rewiring and lab evolution to convert E. coli into autotrophs. The engineered strains harvests energy from formate, which can be produced electrochemically from renewable sources. I assume that means you electrolyze water and you put it, uh, carbon dioxide in it and then you can make formate out of it. And you can do all that without having to burn uh, fossil fuels to make that work. Because formate is an organic one carbon compound that does not serve as a carbon source for E. coli growth. You give E. coli formate, it starves until you throw something else in. It does not support heterotrophic pathways. The researchers also engineered the strain to produce non-native enzymes also. The researchers did that in order to do the other engineered the strain to produce non-native enzymes for carbon fixation and reduction and for harvesting energy from formate. But these changes alone were not enough to support autotrophy because E. coli's metabolism is adapted to heterotrophic growth. It likes to break stuff down. It doesn't like to build up stuff from carbon dioxide. To overcome this challenge, the researchers turned to adaptive laboratory evolution as a, a metabolic optimization tool. They inactivated central enzymes. Now, this is not evolution yet. They're just they're designing the organism and then they're evolving it. They they inactivated central enzymes involved in heterotrophic growth, rendering the bacteria more dependent on autotrophic pathways for growth. They also grew the cells in chemostats with a limited supply of the sugar xylose, so they could barely survive a source of organic compound to inhibit heterotrophic pathways. The initial supply of xylose for approximately 300 days was necessary to support enough cell prolifera proliferation to start kickstart evolution. If you just threw them in and, and see if they sink or swim, they sink. But if you allow them a little float, they float and then they can kind of, and then you can gradually take the float away and pretty soon they're swimming. The chemostat also contained plenty of formate and a 10% CO2 atmosphere. You know how much at, um, CO2 is in the atmosphere right now? 0 0.0417 now, because it's gone up a little bit. But yeah, 0 0.03. In other words, these things can't live unless you pile carbon dioxide on top of them. In this environment, there is a large selective advantage for autotrophs that produce biomass from CO2 as the sole carbon source compared with heterotrophs that depend on xylose as a carbon source for growth. Using isotopic labeling, the researchers confirmed that the evolved isolated bacteria were truly autotrophic, that is, CO2 and not xylose or any other organic compound supported cell growth. And we'll see how they proved that. In order for the general approach of lab evolution to succeed, we had to find a way to couple the desired change in cell behavior to a fitness advantage, Milo said. That was tough and required a lot of thinking and smart design. Design. I've heard that word before somewhere. Um, <clears throat> by sequencing the genome and plasmids of the evolved autotrophic cells, the researchers discovered that as few as 11 mutations were acquired through the evolutionary process in the chemostat. One set of mutations affected genes encoding enzymes linked to the carbon fixation cycle. The second category consisted of mutations found in genes commonly observed to be mutated in previous adaptive la laboratory evolution experiments, suggesting that they are not necessarily specific to autotrophic pathways. 
The third category consisted of mutations in genes with no known role. We'll go over those in a little more detail later. The study describes for the first time a successful transformation of a bacterium's mode of growth, teaching a gut bacterium to do tricks that plants are renowned for was a real long shot, Gleiser says. When we started the directed evolutionary process, we had no clue as to our chances of success, which is always true in scientific research in a sense, and there were no precedents in the literature to guide or suggest the feasibility of such an extreme transformation. But it worked. In addition, seeing in the end the relatively small number of genetic changes required to make this transition was surprising. The authors say that one major study limitation is that the consumption of formate by bacteria releases more CO2 than is consumed through the carbon fixation, through carbon fixation. In addition, more research is needed before it's possible to discuss um, the scalability of the approach for industrial use. It's not ready for prime time yet. In future work, the researchers will aim to supply energy through renewable electricity, presumably got from either sunlight or windmills, to address the problem of CO2 release, determine whether ambient atmospheric conditions could support autotrophy, and try to narrow down the most relevant mutations for autotrophic growth. So those are the things they're gonna look for. I'm gonna skip the last couple paragraphs because they're not relevant for our purposes. Um, the last one has to do with who funded it, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the article that they're talking about is Shemuel Gleiser et al. Conversion of Escherichia coli to generate all biomass carbon from CO2. And there's a reference and there's the website. The summary, interesting, they, they don't call it a, uh, an abstract anymore for whatever reason. The living world is largely divided into autotrophs that convert CO2 into biomass and heterotrophs that consume organic compounds. In spite of widespread interest in renewable energy storage and more sustainable food production, the engineering of industrial re industrially relevant heterotrophic model organisms to use CO2 as their sole carbon source has so far remained an outstanding challenge. Here we report the achievement of this transformation on laboratory timescales. We constructed and evolved E. coli to produce all its biomass carbon from CO2. Reducing power and energy, but not carbon, are, are support, supplied by, via the one carbon molecule formate, which can be produced electrochemically. Rubisco and phosphoribulokinase were co-expressed with formate dehydrogenase to enable CO2 fixation and reduction via the calvin benson bassham cycle. Autotrophic growth was achieved following several months of continuous laboratory evolution in a chemostat under intensifying organic carbon limitation and confirmed via isotopic labeling. Chemostat's just a fancy brewery thing and they bubble CO2 through it, and they call it sparging. So the introduction of the article is autotrophic organisms, that's plants, which generate biomass by fixing inorganic carbon into organic co compounds are the main gateway between the inorganic and living world. Pretty much the only one, actually. They dominate the biomass on Earth, supplying all our food and most of our fuel. A better understanding of the principles of autotrophic growth and methods to enhance it are thus critical on the path to sustainability. By, construction, by constructing synthetic autotrophic organisms, we could learn what the main constraints are on natural autotrophs and how to improve their central metabolic pathways. Well, I don't know if we can improve their central metabolic pathways, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> Thus, a grand challenge in synthetic biology is to engineer autotrophy within a model heterotrophic organism. They're going to make it from scratch. If you can build it, you can understand it. We can break this formidable task into three essential components. To enable a complete transition to autotrophy, the host must, one, 
operates CO2 fixation machinery in a pathway where the carbon input is comprised solely of CO2, while the outputs are organic molecules that enter central carbon metabolism and supply all 12 essential biomass precursors of the cell, um, and therefore basically the whole cell. To, to express enzymatic machinery to obtain reducing power either by harvesting non-chemical energy, light, electricity, or by oxidizing a reduced chemical compound that does not serve as a carbon source. And three, regulate and coordinate the energy harvesting and CO2 fixation pathways so that they together support steady state growth with CO2 as the sole source of carbon. Previous attempts and you'll notice Anatovsky et al. 2016 is one of those references. Anatovsky is one of the authors of our present paper. Um, uh, and uh, a number of other papers as well. Uh, to establish autocatalytic CO2 fixation so uh, cycles in modern heter model heterotrophs required the addition of multi-carbon organic compounds which served at least partially as a carbon source in order to achieve sa stable growth. So they tried it before, but they have to keep adding a little sugar, otherwise it doesn't work. It kind of works a little bit, but not enough. So then now they're trying to see if they can do it all the way. Specifically, the metabolic design in our previous work, our previous work, which has been reported in a couple of places, uh, was such that CO2 was the source of only a third of the cellular biomass carbon, with the rest supplied by an organic acid that serves also as a reducing power and energy source. Therefore, the energy engineering of a heterotrophic organism to supply all its biomass components from inorganic carbon is still a standing challenge. Here we report the establishment of synthetic autotrophy in E. coli. Our engineered E. coli Strain uses the Calvin-Benson-Basham cycle, CBB, also referred to as Calvin cycle for short, for carbon fixation and harvests energy and reducing power from the one carbon molecule formate, um, which can be produced electrochemically. That's related to formic acid, um, which is HCOOH. The stepwise bioengineering process required co-expression of Calvin cycle enzymes and an energy harvesting enzyme, rational rewiring of the endogenous metabolic network, and adaptive laboratory evolution to achieve the desired trophic mode transformation. The establishment of synthetic autotrophy de demonstrates the incredible plasticity of central metabolism and could provide a framework for future carbon neutral bioproduction. Um, uh, I don't know what STAR is, I suppose I should, and that star is their original. Uh, skipping down past a, uh, a table and some uh, other stuff, to stuff that we're interested in, the experimental model and subject details in Escherichia coli. We engineered in, in pardon me, we genera generated an engineered ancestor, engineered sounds kind of like design, no? For chemostat evolution based on the E. coli uh, BW25113 strain, which has been reported previously. We used P1 transduction to transfer knockout alleles from the KEIO strain collection to our engineered strain. So we did a little genetic shifting around and to knock out the genes phospho phosphofructokinase and 6-phosphate-1 dehydrogenase. One of those is in the glycolytic pathway, so it can no longer use glycolytic pathway quite the way it used to. And the other one is um, in... Uh, Uh, I'm not sure where it is exactly. It's, it's one of the other pathways, so it can't use sugar as well as it should. Following the transduction of each knockout allele, the KMR selection marker was removed 
So apparently they, they put it in, they had a marker in it so they could tell which ones actually got it. And then they took the KLM marker by um, using a recombinase encoded by CP20 temperature sensitive plasmid. Loss of the selection marker and the temperature sensitive plasmid were validated by replica plating the screen colonase and PCR analysis of the relevant loci. So they try, they basically they tested, did we get it out again like we wanted to? And sure enough, they did. The engineered delta PFKA, I assume delta means missing, and delta PFKB and delta ZWF strain. So they got rid of all that stuff. And now they're transformed with the PCBB, and that CBB stands for Calvin Benson Bassham plasmid. If you look up Anatoly uh, Ana Antonovsky et al., 2016, that's uh, what that stands for. So basically, they put all of the enzymes they needed to on a plasmid and they stuck it into the cell. With a PFDH plasmid as well, PF, uh, FD is formate dehydrogenase, takes formate out of, and I'll show you the biochemistry of that in a minute, um, uh, takes uh, uh, hydrogen off of formate and transforms it into carbon dioxide. That's right, so this thing produces carbon dioxide while it's growing. With the constitutive, uh, constitutive promoter controlling the expression of the FDH gene. Following whole genome sequencing, we noted that the ancestor, ancestral strain possessed the following three mutations, and they're listed there. An integration of a mobile insertion sequence element into the promoter region of the xyl E gene. So there's a gene that normally works with xylene that has a uh, has a messed up promoter. What, does it go faster? Does it go slower? I don't know. Uh, these mutations were acquired during early handling of the strain prior to chemostat inoculation. So when they did all this other stuff, they found that they had three extra new mutations that they weren't expecting. Okay, and here's the Calvin, uh, the Calvin cycle. And what it does is it takes Ribulose 1,5-biphosphate, it adds carbon dioxide and it turns into, it splits a 5-carbon sugar and carbon dioxide into two, six, uh, two three carbon sugars. And then it reduces them in actually two steps, um, one uh, requiring ATP to, uh, to phosphorylate both ends of it and then another one to take NADP and to convert this from an acid, which is what it was originally, into an aldehyde. Now, one of those five it gets to, one of those six it gets to keep, the other five go here, get rearranged, and uh, they have one arrow here. Actually, if you look carefully, they have three arrows. It's more than three. I'm gonna show you in a minute uh, what it actually does. And then you get three ribulose three five phosphates, which you take ATP, which with photosynthesis you can make enough of, and uh, and you take one of those phosphates and put it on the other end of it until you have ribulose one five biphosphate, and then it's ready for re-splitting with that enzyme, which is called Rubisco. That's ri ru biphosphate, uh, I don't know what the C, uh, S is, but the CO is from CO2. I know, they just made it short. And here's the more complete version, which I've uh, drawn, I couldn't find a, a, I could only find one that was semi-good, and that one said they, uh, they didn't want uh, people using it, so. Uh, you start with ribulose 1,5-biphosphate, and then you change it to glycer, uh, glyceric acid, and then when in that two-step process, you turn it into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and you take two of those and join them to fructose 6-phosphate. And then 
you take another glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and you switch one of the carbons around so that now you have erythrose 4 phosphate and xylose 5 phosphate. And then you take that erythro erythrose 4 phosphate and you add another glyceraldehyde and you get uh, septulose 7 phosphate and then um, you take uh, one of those glyceraldehyde 3 phosphates, join it to this thing, that's 3 and 7, and you split it down the middle and now you have two fives, one of them being ribose 5-phosphate, which you probably heard of ribose, and the other one back to xylose 5-phosphate. These two xyloses and this one ribose are then both converted into, or all three converted into ribulose 5-phosphate and then you've got to phosphorylate the other end. So it's a big complicated mess. Now the reaction that they have here is really quite straightforward. You have formate, which is negatively charged. You have NAD. Um, I'm not sure whether they're using NAD. That's nicotine adenine dif uh, difos uh, dinucleotide, which uh, uses uh, a nicotinic acid or otherwise known as niacin. Those of you who may remember way, way back when that used to be vitamin B3 before they discovered it wasn't actually a, vi a vitamin, uh, but it's still useful. And uh, then w that takes one of the, it takes the hydrogen out and the uh, charges cancel and so you get NADH out of it and then you get uh, CO2. So this thing makes CO2 while it's getting its energy source. Uh, it's a net producer of carbon dioxide. It's not a net consumer. But it does consume carbon dioxide as well. Uh, method details, preparation and utilization of growth media, plasmid cloning, and genomic modifications are carried out in a particular kind of medium with uh, relevant antibiotics. Antibiotics, they kill stuff, don't they? Well, what they're doing is they're using E. coli that can't escape from the laboratory because they are dependent upon canamycin and chloramphenicol and or streptomycin. If they don't have those antibiotics, their uh, protein mechanisms are deformed. Uh, their protein uh, ribosomes are deformed. With the antibiotics, they can work. Without the antibiotics, they can't, which is the reverse of most bacteria, which if they have the antibiotics, they don't work. And so these are mutated organisms that can't live on their own. That way, if they get out, they don't invade the countryside. Engineered and evolved strains were grown on M9 minimal media. That's a technical uh, supplemented with trace elements, and we'll see those trace elements in a bit. And the relevant carbon sources, formate and CO2. In the 13C labeling experiments, and for accurate estimation of growth parameters of the evolved cells on formate as the only compound, we used HPLC grade water and omitted EDTA from the trace elements. They're describing it to you so that if you're a scientist and you want to check their work, you can do it yourself. The trace element components and their concentration in the M9 media are the EDTA, which as they said, and they're doing the carbon-13 labeling experiments, they omit that, and also uh, iron, zinc, copper, cobalt, uh, boron, that's borate, and manganese. So they have to put all those elements in in order to make those things grow. They require little bitty pieces of them for certain enzymes. Result, metabolic rewiring and lab evolution for conversion to autotrophy. In order to convert E. coli to autotrophy in the laboratory, we, um, and I'm not gonna read the whole thing, so if you see green ellipses, I'm omitting stuff chose formate as our electron source because this one carbon organic compound can serve as a source of reducing power, but does not naturally support the growth of E. coli and is not as, uh, assimilated into biomass. So they could be sure that if they give 
formate, it wasn't going to uh, help the organism grow. It might help it live, but not grow. Another advantage is that it can be electrochemically produced, that is formate, from renewable sources, and is seen as a promising uh, path for carbon negative biomass formation. To harvest the electrons from formate and direct them into the main cellular reducing power reservoir, NADH, we used an NAD plus corpul uh, coupled formate dehydrogenase from the methylotrophic bacterium Pseudomonas. Stoichiometric analysis of the metabolic network in E. coli suggests that the addition of FDH, formate dehydrogenase, rubisco, and phosphoribulokinase, that's what's on that CBB uh, thing that they put in, is sufficient for in silico autotrophic growth. In M9 minimal media with formate and CO2 as co substrates. Yet co-expression of the three recombinant enzymes in a naive BW25113 uh, E. coli strain did not result in growth in autotrophic conditions. So they put all those enzymes in and it didn't work. So now what are we going to do? The stoichiometric analysis does not take into account requirements such as tuning enzyme kinetics, expression level, and regulation. We thus decided to use adaptive laboratory evolution as a metabolic organization tool to achieve autotrophic growth. To drive flux towards the desired metabolic pathway, we employed adaptive laboratory evolution. Our approach combines rewiring central metabolism to establish a dependence. So that there's a design to, to start with. Um, on the Rubisco uh, carboxylation flux, tailoring the growth medium to inhibit flux through the native heterotrophic pathways, basically starving the organisms mostly, uh, and providing a significant selective advantage to utilizing autotrophic pathways. If they start using CO2 as their main source, good, they can grow faster. The way in which our approach was implemented is shown in figure 2a. At, at first we knocked out the three genes, okay, uh, in the oxidative uh, pentose phosphate pathway. The former has two in, so it can't grow on xylose very well. Can't grow on glucose much at all. Uh, the former has two ice enzymes, and so they had to knock out both. Um, when growing cells on xylose, this rewiring ensures that cellular growth is dependent on carboxylation by Rubisco. Second, we heterologously uh, expressed Rubisco, PRK, carbonic anhydrase, so they had to add carbonic anhydrase to this mixture, and formate dehydrogenase. Third, we drew our, uh, grew our cells in xylose-limited chemostats, which maintain cells in constant starvation for organic sugar carbon. They can barely survive. This growth medium allows cells to proliferate, which is essential for evolution to take place. So if they don't let them grow at all, they don't, if they don't multiply, they can't mutate and then have the mutated ones grow better. But it does inflict, pardon me, um, inhibit the flux through heterotrophic catabolic pathways. So it's, it's hard to grow. The chemostat also contained an excess of formate and was constantly sparged. That means they bubbled carbon dioxide through with CO2 enriched air, 10%. Thus, we created conditions where we, where we predict that cells that accumulate mutations leading to diversion of flux to the autotrophic pathway are selected. Such cells will reduce their dependence on the external organic sugar and carbon input and gain a large selective advantage compared to the non-mutated cells which are limited by the supply of xylose. Once they kick over to using CO2, they can grow faster and you can pick them out. Upon the inoculation of the engineered strain into the xylose limited chemostat with an excess level of formate, the residual levels of xylose dropped below the detection level as expected under carbon limited chemostat growth. They used up all of the xylose. We extracted samples from the chemostat once a week and tested for growth in autotrophic conditions. After about 200 days of chemostat propagation, equivalent to about 150 chemostat generations, less than one generation a day, you'll notice. We observed growth in media devoid of xylose. It finally started to grow without having to have xylose. This 
phenotype persisted in all samples taken from that day on. Once it started, it kept going. Starting at a day about 350 of the Chemostat Adaptive Laboratory Evolution Experiment, we omitted xylose from the feed media altogether, as shown in figure 2b. Uh, the sustained growth and turbidity implied full takeover by xylose independent cells in the chemostat. We continued to validate growth of the extracted samples by repeatedly re-diluting them into fresh xylose free media and they kept growing. The samples required elevated CO2 if you dropped it much below 10 percent they don't grow, suggesting a carbon fixation growth mechanism. In other words, they need carbon, and they need way more, more than what's in the air. One of the isolated clones that showed more robust growth was chosen for in-depth characterization and exhibited a doubling time of 18 plus or minus four hours. This one, instead of taking over a day to grow, it grew in about three quarters of a day. Twice as fast, more or less, as shown by figures 2C and S3. The cells had formate to biomass conversion yield of, um, and it gives that number, similar to microorganisms that naturally grow autotrophically on formate. Oh, there are other organisms that grow on formate that are not E. coli. So they were actually having to add that. Well, you remember they added a plasmid that contained it. Um, Labeling by carbon 13 demonstrate that all biomass carbon is derived from CO2. How do you know that this is actually coming from CO2? They're going to show you. To test whether the evolved cells are indeed autotrophic and eliminate the possibility of unaccounted for carbon sources or significant heterotrophic formate assimilation, <coughs> we conducted comprehensive isotope labeling experiments. First, we grew one of the evolved clones in an environment with carbon-13 labeled formate and carbon-13 CO2 for about 10 generations until uh, isotopic steady state. It just kept growing and growing and growing. <coughs> and analyzed the C th C13 labeling patterns of various metabolites using LC mass spectrometer. Carbon comes in three isotopes, carbon-14 you all know about, carbon-12 and carbon-13. Carbon-13 is about 1% of the normal carbon. Um, and what they did was they grew it on like 99% or so. We observed that biomass building blocks across central metabolism had about 98% of their carbon atoms labeled. So yeah, most of them are labeled now, way most of them. This is in line with the labeled formate and CO2 comprising about 99% uh, C13 and about 1% unlabeled bicarbonate dissolved in the growth media. It's awfully hard to make it 100%, it really is. This provides definitive evidence that the cell's biomass carbon is derived solely from CO2 and formate. To test whether formate is directly assimilated into biomass, the evolved cells were grown in minimal M9 media <coughs> supplemented with C13 labeled formate. The cultures were grown in a vessel with an air permeable cover inside a shaking incubator with elevated CO2, 10%, naturally labeled. So the C13 labeling pattern of biomass building blocks following growth in this environment showed 1 to 2% uh, C13 labeling. We're going to see that uh, in, a, in a graph uh, in just a minute which is the value expected based on the natural abundance of C13 plus minor amounts of labeled formate being oxidized to C13O2 and then fixed before equilibrating with the overall C, um, uh, 13 co 2 pool. These results demonstrate that the evolved cells essentially do not assimilate formate. One very minor exception is the incorporation of carbon from formate into one of the carbons of the purine rings. Uh, but, however, this is not a necessity of the de novo purine biosynthetic pathway, but rather a technical issue because the formal moiety can either originate from formate if it is present in the media or from 10 formal tetrahydrofolate, which originates from serine. This is how the, the uh, uh, E. coli makes their purine rings. That's, you know, adenine and guanine. Um, uh, without 
a lot of folate, uh, pardon me, without a lot of uh, formate in the solution. Um, the finding of neg negligible formate assimilation together with the previous results indicate that there is no carbon source beyond CO2 and formate entering the biomass, serving as strong evidence that the evolved E. coli cells are indeed autotrophic. They're not getting their stuff from formate, essentially. So here's the normal, and if you have about 1.2% carbon-13, uh, then that's what you get in the E. coli. No surprise there. You add formate 98% uh, uh, C13, and you go up a little tiny bit, but basically not much. Now you, if you add carbon-13 to the CO2, whether it is added to the formate or not, well, if you don't add it to the formate, you have a little tiny bit less. Not statistically relevant, but probably there is some. Um, but as you can see, you have uh, basically all, you know, goes from 1.5% to 98%. And if you give wild type standard old E. coli, carbon-13 labeled glucose, with everything carbon-13, why it grows the same way with about 98%. So the 98% is really what you expect if it's getting everything from, uh, from CO2. So it is actually growing on CO2. In another validation experiment, we grew the cells and vessels with labeled uh, carbon-13 CO2 and unlabeled formate, which we just went over. Because of the cost of uh, carbon-13 CO2, it's pretty expensive to make. This experiment is performed in closed vessels, which leads to some accumulation of unlabeled, they can't just keep washing it out, some accumulation of unlabeled CO2 coming from the formate, of course, that it, um, thus polluting the labeled uh, C13O2 pool. But this can be monitored and corrected for by analyzing the labeling of glutamate or proline versus arginine as the latter is produced from the former by the addition of CO2 in the form of soluble bicarbonate. And um, so there's a bunch of calculations that they did. We observed the biomass building blocks across central metabolism had 85 to 90 percent of their carbon atoms labeled. As shown in figures 3a and b when corrected for the effective labeling of intracellular co2 the 13 carbon labeled fraction of the biomass building blocks is close to 100 percent 98 percent to be specific showing in an independent and detailed manner the autotrophic nature of the evolved e coli yes it is really getting its carbon from carbon dioxide Laboratory evolution facilitated the conversion to autotrophy via a relatively small number of mutations. So once you get these things, we haven't got them designed well enough, so we, we put them through uh, an evolutionary process to refine it. To better elucidate the genetic basis for the trophic mode conversion to autotrophy, we isolated from the chemostat six clones capable of autotrophic growth on formate and sequence their genome in plasmids. And they have a list of the mutations. Strikingly, as shown in figure four, we observed relatively few mutations fixed in the autotrophic clones on top of the ancestral genetic background. We divided the mutation, mutated genes into three broad categories as described below. And here, the first category consists of genes encoding enzymes with a direct metabolic link to the function of the Calvin cycle. So it actually fine-tuned it for this particular bacterium. A second category of mutated genes consists of those commonly observed to be mutated in previous adapted laboratory evolution experiments. E. coli is meant to live in your gut. It does. These things are living in the laboratory. It's an artificial environment, and certain mutations help them grow faster. And sure enough, they show up in this laboratory experiment also. The last ca category of mutated genes include mutations that currently have no characterized role and maybe hitchhiker mutations. They don't know what they do. Maybe they help, maybe they don't, maybe they're just random noise. Discussion. In this study, we demonstrate that it is possible to convert the trophic mode of an obligated he heterotroph, E. coli, to full autotrophy over laboratory timescales through the expression of heterologous genes, 
that's designed, combined with metabolic rewiring and laboratory evolution. This rapid trophic mode transformation showcases the outstanding plasticity of metabolism, especially if you have a designer involved, <coughs> and demonstrates the power of the framework described here for designing and implementing the rewiring of cellular metabolism. The applied approach combines rational design with laboratory evolution that focuses on coupling cellular fitness to the desired functionality. The rationale behind this coupling is that predicting all possible constraints on the implementation of new metabolic functions is limited by insufficient information. We don't really understand how all this stuff works regarding the kinetics and regulation of the relevant components. Therefore, instead of attempting to rationally design components that comply with all the possible constraints, we created a rewired metabolic configuration and applied selective conditions under which the desired metabolic function is linked to fitness. So basically, you let it mutate, and if it works better, then you use it. Now, of course, it doesn't work better for the human body, but that's okay. This link allowed us to, allows us to harness the power of natural selection for fine-tuning the metabolic network such that it would com accomplish the new metabolic function. Because the cellular fitness of the rational, rationally designed strains is linked to the activity of the induced metabolic pathway, if this metabolic pathway is initially not active, the ancestor strain would not be able to grow. So if you throw them in and just let them sink or swim, they're going to sink. To bridge this gap, an important component of the approach is the use of chemostats. So we're going to throw them in, but we're going to give them just enough sugar to get by, but not enough to grow much. And then, as time goes on, we'll reduce the sugar load, which is also in the article, but I haven't shown it to you. When using chemostats to grow scales continuously, the supply of limiting amounts of a surrogate substrate, for example, like uh, xylose, which compensates for the lack of full activity in the induced pathway, allows cells to slowly grow and facilitates the evolutionary process. The feedback that chemostats inherently implement keeps the surrogate substrate at very low concentrations and thus maintains a continuously strong selective pressure to integrate the non-native pathway. The innovative potential of synthetic biology has led to an explosion of interest in leveraging recent advances towards sustainability challenges. One of the most important challenges is the assimilation of atmospheric CO2 for the production of food, fuels, and biochemicals. Although much progress has been made in recent years, all previous attempts at integrating synthetic CO2 assimilation pathways in non-native hosts have met limited success. Well, I would say this is limited success too, but it's better than before, I guess. Achieving synthetic autotrophy in a central biotechnological organism such as E. coli sets an important milestone toward the sustainable production of chemicals from CO2. Currently growing our autotrophic E. coli strain on formate as an energy source leads to an overall net CO2 production because formate is oxidized to CO2 at a higher rate than at which CO2 is assimilated into biomass. So even after they've done all this stuff, they're producing more carbon dioxide than they're incorporating into the bacteria. Yet in future coupling uh, to a renewable energy source, formate would be produced electrochemically from CO2, which means that you're actually taking CO2 out of the atmosphere with a negative greenhouse gas emissions. Yes! This study is therefore a stepping stone to future efforts seeking to understand evolutionary transitions and harnessing syn synthetic biology on the path to more sustainable bioproduction. So if you read the paper, it sounds like they've proved that evolution works and it sounds like they're getting ready to get rid of CO2 when neither one of those statements is really quite true. My uh, take on all this is uh, don't believe the press releases. The paper is, shall we say, overenthusiastic. I mean, they did some neat stuff, but it hasn't gotten where they need to go. But the press release was horrible. Using CO2 for energy, it's not using a CO2 for energy, it's using it to build itself. That's all. 
and it's producing more CO2 than it's, than it's, um, uh, than it's uh, using. The way to get your research funded is to attach it to uh, <coughs> uh, climate change. Um, is this really a breakthrough? Well, technically yes, but practically maybe not. The organisms are interesting. They put out more carbon dioxide than they used to grow. What's wrong with this picture? In order to incorporate carbon dioxide into an organism, you have to have energy, right? Large concentrations of carbon dioxide are needed for this organism. Can it get down to one, less than one hundredth of what it requires now? Uh, one needs an energy source. So what are you going to use for an energy source? Well, you can use formate, I guess. But formate is going to require energy to make it. So ultimately, you're going to need sunlight for that. You could use sulfur. Now you're going to produce a lot of sulfur dioxide, and you have to mine sulfur in order to do that, which is going to cost you some energy too. Um, how about light? Do we know any organisms that can use light to fix CO2? I think I've run into a few of them. Um, and they don't even need large concentrations of CO2. They can take it from the atmosphere, just the way it is. In fact, they were taking it from the atmosphere when the atmospheric concentration of CO2 was 0.025%. Uh, Why not just plant trees? Three, notice that none of the organisms evolved Rubisco let alone all of the enzymes that are needed to fix uh, feed on formate and fix CO2, they had to be given those by design. Evolution can tune the final product. It does not produce whole new enzymes. Uh, and the mathematical difficulties of finding whole new enzymes are astronomical, literally. We are not so much looking at evolution as at intelligent design. Even the evolution was intelligently designed. They set things up so that they would get what they wanted. Next week, this is number four, and this is uh, where the reason why I included this paper. Otherwise, it's kind of a meh paper. Um, next week, we will discuss carbon-14 in dinosaur bones and microbes that all of that stuff is made by microbes. Note that the vast majority of microbes do not have the enzymes necessary to fix CO2. And why should they? Unless they have an energy source, there's no point. So the question that I'm going to leave with you is how are those microbes going to be able to get carbon-14 from the environment if it can't diffuse in as CO2 then you're going to have to transfer it in as organic compounds. That makes it really hard to believe that you can get a nice even concentration of carbon-14 in a dinosaur bone because it's not coming through as carbon dioxide. It has to come through some other way. And you would expect it to, you know, the outside to be the most contaminated and so forth. If you find consistent carbon-14 all the way through dinosaur bones, it suggests that maybe it started that way, which of course means they're not that old. But we'll talk more about that next week. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, comment over here. Well, uh, first of all, a question. Remind me what Rubisco is. Ribulus 1,5-biphosphate. It splits, uh, and that, I don't know what the technical term for it, but it's the enzyme that splits it f from uh, Ribulus 5-carbon sugar. It takes carbon dioxide and it attaches right. it to one side. And when you get done, you have two molecules of glycerate-3-phosphate. Uh, yes. 
<clears throat> so, but Rubisco is a, an organic carbon source. Well, it's an enzyme that takes... Oh, it is the enzyme. That's the what enzyme. I was missing. That's right. I, I guess it's so common they've... Uh, uh, people just, it us, rolls yeah, off the tongue. Right. <clears throat> well, the, the paper makes one very clear point, and that is this is not autotrophy. It depends on how you define autotrophy. It is taking carbon dioxide from the, I don't want to say ambient air because 10% carbon dioxide is not ambient air, but from the atmosphere that's being created. But it does in fact re require a pre-existing carbon source. That's right, it requires, well it actually which, doesn't. Which makes it, it, it not what autotrophy. They, well what they did is they they made it so that the uh, other carbon source cannot be used to uh, incorporate carbon into the organism itself. It has to take that carbon source and turn it into NADP. So they, they need another five to ten years of in-lab evolution before that happens? They need another five to ten years of in-lab design and then maybe evolution to fine-tune it. Of, of course. I mean, I, uh, you look at what they've done. They've, they've yeah. taken enzymes and they've just flat out planted them. I think, I think the thing that struck me the most was until they get an energy source that does not require carbon produced by another source of energy, in other words, you don't have photophosphorylation happening, it's not autotrophy. It, it, the net is definitely not. I mean, they're net, they're net CO two producers. So they're net they CO two producers, even though technically, you know, they're getting all of their carbon from carbon dioxide, but they're producing more carbon dioxide than they're using. So, so you're not where you need to be, I, and and you can never get where you need to be. I mean, it's it's sort of like perpetual motion machines. It's like perpetual energy. You can't get there from here because carbon dioxide is fully oxidized. Yeah, there's another serious flaw, it seems to me, and that is in an attempt to prevent this new E. coli from escaping, they make it antibiotic dependent. Right. But our history for decades now with hospital and other kinds of uh, Infec what happens if infection it back is, to the wild type? Is quick evolution. Yeah. Where they no, they no longer are held back. So they create this and it evolves in non-dependence. Uh, it, it's fine if it does some minor uh, or, you know, changes that we don't really care about. If it requires formate, there's not enough formate around to, for the, to live on. But what happens if it acquires characteristics that we don't like, like spreading to the brain and frying everything? Now or we're spreading, in spreading deep to the environment and, and suddenly and wiping out of, suddenly multiplying so fast. Yes. And, uh, okay. and one thing to keep in mind is that I'm, I'm, I don't know for absolute sure, but I'm going to bet that they smell like E. coli. <laughs> Which smells like... That's an experience like, I, don't, I can't judge. Which smells like poop. <laughs> Some people would use a different word for it. Okay. <laughs> How does this... Uh, uh, I, I know... Oh, it is. Okay. Um, I, there's... There's companies that uh, have been able to make plastic from from air, basically. And uh, are, are they using uh, just the hydrocarbon aerosols from industrial waste, or is it actually coming from the CO2? I don't know the answer to that. I would have to look at the, the paper itself. Uh, it, one of the things I think you learn after reading this is you cannot believe the press releases. <laughs> The press release clearly says in the summary and the first paragraph that they're using CO2 as an energy source. I'm sorry, they're not. And it produces more CO2 than it 
uses to build itself. So, you know, it sounds wonderful, and, and, and it, it's, like I say, it's interesting, but it's not even close to solving global warming, assuming that that needs to be solved. So with this experiment or paper, what question was it attempting to answer? They were trying to produce an, an, a, uh, an organism that could grow using CO2 only. See, because if you could do that, then presumably all the CO2 that it's using is being pulled out of the air and, and sequestered and is no longer floating around and it's one nice way for us to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions by just reabsorbing them somehow. So this, <laughs> this organism would make uh, a bunch of poop that would burn like crazy if... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess, and um, and I suppose in the meantime we'll be you know polluting our air with cobalt and uh, uh, and manganese and whatever. Uh, it, it it sounds good until you realize that you can't get here from there without energy, and if you're going to go that way, why not take the natural stuff that grows by itself and is already adapted to this. It, basically these guys are trying to reinvent the wheel. And it's a nice exercise because now you know how wheels work and these are really complicated wheels. But in terms of fixing things, why don't you just take the wheels that are out there, you know, just buy them off the shelf, so to speak. Well, if you did invent a perpetual motion machine, that would make you a lot of money, wouldn't it? it That's would. what everybody's thought for, for generations. It would. <laughs> it would. And, um, and um, uh, you know, I know somebody who, who owns a bridge in Brooklyn that uh, wants to sell it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Very simple question. Uh, when I listen to James Tour, and there, he's building these little micro vehicles, uh -huh. and he talks about trying to get from point A to point uh, Z. Yes, yes. And you can start the it's process. It's not just B. We're talking about B, C, D, E, F, and, and then having Everything. to go to H and then come back yeah. to. Yeah. And so, uh, scientists standing over their experiment is not evolution starting at point A and working its way through to point Z without any, uh, every time it fails, mm -hmm. it doesn't have a memory, so it's got to go back mm -hmm. to the beginning again. And so that's what the scientists are. They're the beginning, yeah. wherever it is in the process. Yeah. Now, I will say this, that evolution does fine tune this stuff. Uh, in the sense of you turn the organisms loose, their mutations, some of them are bad, some of them are neutral, they may or may not spread, some of them are good, and they actually do spread. Uh, they're good at least for this environment. Okay, so, so there is some evolution happening, but it's at the level of we're going to change one nucleotide. It's not at the level of we're going to create Rubisco de novo. So th it's really an important point to keep in mind. Uh, yes. A new term. Design dependent natural selection. <laughs> yes. And, and this is what, you know, you can produce pigeons with these big flowery things over their heads and and curly cued feathers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they're not very good at living outside of uh, human uh, cages, but you know, they're, uh, they're neat, you can do it, but you're not gonna get a hawk out of it. 
Well, my intent was to infer that the design dependence was the brains of the scientists. Yes, yes. And, uh, and these E. coli, they work really well in chemostat vats. You let them out, you hope that nothing bad happens. Probably nothing bad will happen because they're simply incompetent. Nobody wants to actually try it and see because they might be wrong. But they're certainly, they're certainly not as good as a wild type. You might as well just use wild type if, if what you want is E. coli to do what E. coli does in nature. The wild type is better. So, if you read those nice little um, headlines, uh, dig into the details before you just accept what scientists say is true. In fact, that's precisely the reason why scientists are supposed to give their data. And if you have a scientist who says, yeah, I have this wonderful thing, but you can't see my data. That is the opposite of the way science is supposed to do. If somebody is doing tree rings and they're tree ring matching and stuff, they should be happy not only to, um, they, they should have their, you know, their tree rings uh, listed as all the data they got, but also photos of the tree rings, especially now when it doesn't cost that much, you know? Take your little camera and click it. And then just show the, show the tree rings the way they are. And if you don't believe me, you can look at it and uh, you can come to your own conclusions. Because the whole point of science is to be transparent. Whenever somebody says, this is true because I say so, they have stopped being a scientist. Anyway, come back next week and we're gonna find out that they're finding carbon-14 in dinosaur bone all the time. And that the argument that we should not have seen the data from the paleo group is just nuts. What they're really objecting to is not the paleo group's data. It's that they didn't put the right spin on it. But anyway, we'll see you next week.